Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. What you just heard was a recording made by the 14-year-old Solomon McCoskey. He was also very good looking, wasn't he? <laughs> not that he isn't good looking. Not that he, not that he isn't good looking now. Um, I I'm, I'm first must remind you uh, to uh, turn off your cell phones, please, if, you, if you've got them on. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inauguration of the Solomon Gadlis Mikowski Recital Hall. I, I am pleased and honored to greet those of you who are here with us on this joyous occasion in this wonderful space, as well as those watching the simulcast from the William R. and Irene D. Miller Recital Hall downstairs, and those of you joining us via webcast from around the world. Solomon, I am the first of many this afternoon who will applaud you for your steadfast support of young musicians and the remarkable gift you have given them with this recital hall. The joy and passion uh, that Solomon expressed already in his playing of Bach at the age of 14 has been magnified and magnified many, many times, several exponential times uh, in his teaching and in his great, great uh, performing throughout the years. And some of the posters you see both outside and in his studio give you some idea of his extraordinary reach. In, in bearing your name, this space is a testament to your leadership, vision, and tireless dedication to your students and to this school. Uh, there could be no better tribute to your exemplary mentorship of young artists than the 12 performances we are about to hear. These are all highly accomplished and very successful pianists, but I think what's most striking for me is how different they all are from each other. This is the sign of truly great teaching, that, uh, that the teacher can bring out what's best in each individual. No cookie-cutter teaching for uh, Solomon Mikowski. And you're going to hear 12 very different and very distinct voices this afternoon. It is thanks to your guidance that these remarkable pianists have achieved such success. We are proud to have you as a valued member of this community. And on behalf of Vicki and myself and the entire community, I am proud to have you as a colleague and as a friend. It is now my honor to introduce Ineza Sinkevich, our first performer.
You know, in 1969, Manhattan School of Music bought this wonderful building from the Juilliard School. And a condition of that purchase was that the Manhattan School of Music Preparatory Division would absorb the Juilliard Pre-College Division. Our challenge was that there were more teachers in the pre-college, in the Juilliard pre-college than they were in Manhattan School. We were a small school at that time. Janet Skank was the founder of the school. And she was determined that we would keep the tradition of Manhattan School if this merger were to happen. Well, Solomon Mikowski was one of those teachers that came to us from that merger. At the time, I was in charge of the performing classes. Students would come in every week, play their concerts, like some of these young people. They were with me then. They came, Gioviani, uh, Simona, I won't even go name them. They came to play. And Every week I would get a card, a blue card, that would say the name of the student and what piece they were playing. And I, after a while, I began to realize a certain style of teaching. They were Solomon's students. And I said to one young boy, I said, what does he look like? And he says, well, he wears glasses and he talks funny. <laughs> so that, <laughs> well, it didn't take long for the college division of Manhattan School to recognize this gifted teacher and this great talent. And he was soon appointed to the fa college faculty. And I remember years later at one of the auditions when there was something like 20, or I'm sorry, about 50 students applying for the college, 23 were asking for Solomon Mikowski. It's, it's been just some journey for me to watch, to see Solomon his dedication to his students. Each one, he wanted to know where they were living, how they were living, 
who they were living with, where they eating. If they didn't have a tuxedo, he bought the tuxedo. When they graduated, he became their impresario. Solomon, you were the impresario. He would look for concerts halls for them. He would look for performances. In some cases, he even rented major concert halls so he can introduce his students to the New York audience. He encouraged his students to enter into international competitions. If they couldn't afford to go, he'd pay the airfare. Solomon, we know your, what you did for your students and what you have done for these students. In the 1980s, I took a group of 20, uh, 20 Manhattan School of Music teachers to Taiwan for three consecutive uh, summers to do master classes and workshops. Solomon's reputation had preceded him. We got to Taiwan at students all wanting to study with him. The Chinese were absolutely wonderful. They would give us banquets twice a day. But Solomon, even though he was able to master the master classes, could never master those chopsticks. <laughs> because every time we sat down, out would come his fork. <laughs> he would do it. Well, Solomon, it's just been my pleasure to watch you over all these years. And if Janet Skank were here today, she would be the first one to say, you have continued to teach in the tradition that has been Manhattan School of Music. You have brought more prestige to this school, such honor to the school. And I have to say, for me, it's been an honor to be a small part of your life, and I hope I will always be your friend. Thank you.
decided to ruin my reputation. <laughs> and even though I can't say it for many, many years, I had to join the party. No. So in yes. Order, in order to do that, I had to play something that no one knows. You don't find out in the But I'm going to try, forgive me, if I cannot live up to your expectations. <laughs>
for a myriad of reasons, I'm really, really, really honored to be here with you today uh, for the opening of this wonderful hall made possible by that wonderful man. My admiration for Solomon started nearly 25 years ago, and I respect him so much. This admiration started in part with our long conversations over dinner here in New York, in my office sometimes, here at MSM, and also over brunch on Sundays in Chicago. As a teacher and mentor, Solomon is like few others. Some music professors are extraordinarily skilled technicians. Others are wonderful artists who convey deep musical concepts, and others care deeply for and nurture their students daily. Well, Solomon is one of the few who embodies all of these things in one nearly superhuman being. I want to share with you another aspect that, of Solomon that I really cherish. When I headed enrollment here at MSM, I would sit and talk about how best to award our precious and scarce scholarship dollars. He would tell me that even though a student may have scored second out of 500 students, that they didn't need a full scholarship and would attend MSM anyway. At the same time, he would tell me about the student who scored 15th out of that 500. And they came from an extremely poor family, and they really needed the 100% scholarship as opposed to the 90% scholarship they may have gotten otherwise. And what was interesting was that he clearly knew that those scholarship dollars were scarce and that we could get two of the, the wonderful pianists for the same or less cost. Wise counsel from a very wise man. It's also great to be here to hear these musicians behind me in this wonderful new space. Most of the artists we are hearing today I knew as students either here or in Chicago, and it's a pleasure to see them and hear how they've grown as artists. And that leads me to my continuing relationship with Solomon in Chicago. A few years after I left New York, Solomon called me. He had a very special student that couldn't come to MSM for a variety of reasons. He asked if she might audition at Chicago College of Performing Arts, where I was dean, and that if admitted and able to attend, could he come to Chicago every few Sundays to teach her? I know Solomon's standards. And I knew immediately that this would be a fine student. And she was indeed a fine student, and in short order won multiple prizes in international competitions. That student, Inessa Sienkiewicz, was our first performer today. <laughs> Others have followed Inessa to Chicago, including Wael, who you'll hear in a few minutes. And have also, and, and Solomon has grown to love his other conservatory on the uh, central coast. <laughs> um, and he's also grown to love that school so that he has recently pledged to do the same for that college, which I'm no longer the dean of, I'm provost of the university, to do the same for that college as he has done for this institution, and soon we will be dedicating a hall similar to this at Chicago College of Foreign Arts. In closing, I want to talk about one last passion of his. He's got lots of passions, as you know. His need and his obsession to scratch things off that little yellow list he carries around. <laughs> those, yeah. those lists festooned with what I can only make out as scribbling. I <laughs> now, some days at MSM, when I felt I was juggling 150 different things, I would be walking down the hall, and I would hear in this wonderful Spanish accent, Jim, Jim, I need to see you. And my first internal reaction, kept inside, was before knowing what he wanted was often, oh, please, Solomon, I've got so much work to do. <laughs> but once we began to talk, I realized he was just making sure that some important letter that had to be sent to a prospective student actually had been sent, or perhaps that something I had promised to do which I may not yet have finished, was actually going to get done on time. 
Solomon, you have taught hundreds and hundreds of students, many of who have su succeeded at the highest level as demonstrated here today. You have served this institution most particularly and CCPA with great, great distinction. And now you are leaving a lasting gift, this legacy to Manhattan School of Music and its students. Solomon, I thank you for this generous gift to both institutions. I thank you for inviting me to be here today, and I thank you for being my colleague and my friend.
very emotional for me just listening to Dr. McCoskey's feelings. I still think of you that way, even though I'm allowed to say Solomon now. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm at 40. Um, but uh, I, I have to say that I studied um, with Dr. McCoskey when I was from the age of 9 to 16 when I graduated high school. And that's a very long time ago. And I have a lot of memories, but it's like a dream, sort of. And when I listen to everybody play, I have to say it's like um, hearing my relatives. <laughs> I feel like, oh, that's, that's what Dr. Mikowski taught me, and, and that's what he taught me. And uh, it's just, I, I feel a bad for smiling so easily. <laughs> I have to say thank you. And, um, you made everybody into a poet, and it came so beautiful. And I just, um, I love him so much, and for him to do that to me.
somebody made a reference to the yellow page, the yellow paper, I cannot survive without it. The problem is that I am not a public speaker. And if you don't believe me, just stay and listen to me. Um, the, uh, the first thing I want to know, I want, you to, I want to tell you, is that I was just about to cancel this, this uh, afternoon performance because I didn't know, I didn't have a tie to wear. And Gioviani and his lovely wife, Tinky, gave me this uh, Givenchy tie, so I felt I was dressed up for the occasion. Now, uh, unfortunately, I have not checked what I'm going to say to you with my beloved Sarah. She checks everything I say, everything I write, <laughs> and she has kept me from increasing the, um, the number of enemies that I have <laughs> uh, with very wise advice. But this time, I'm on my own. <laughs> and uh, when I got the Presidential Medal, I had prepared a speech of 14 minutes. Most of them were jokes. And the President, when I was about to go on stage, said, you cannot speak for more than five minutes. So this time I didn't ask him, <laughs> you know, and uh, that's why he'll have to sit here and listen to me. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was reading the wrong side of the page. Now I'm on the um, First of all, uh, this hall is small, but I find out I found out that it can be enlarged with the help of Mr. and Mrs. Miller. We are partners, we're in business now. Because our home, my hall can be uh, used for big occasions by having your hall add the space, the seats, and the beauty. Mr. Miller has donated an incredible hall, and so has Mr. and Mrs. Ace, which I don't know if they are here. Yes, okay, well, anyway, these are people who are really shown in an incredible contribution. I'm sorry. To the to yes, to this school. <laughs> uh, so, um, just one second. Now, you would think that tonight would be an occasion for joy, right? I should be so happy. How could I be more happy than this? I'm actually depressed. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I did not know the effect that looking at myself with that much hair at age 18 <laughs> would have on me. And my sister, who is here, and I'm so honored by her presence here, and by her daughter, Aida, and her husband, Charles Wiseman, and Rene and George Lerman, my relatives, finally, they show up to hear something of what I'm doing <laughs> before I die. So. Um, she knows that it was at one year later after that photo that I began to lose my hair. <laughs> and um, it was her husband, Isidoro, who unfortunately cannot be with us anymore, who said to me when I said, I want to do this, but I can't afford it. I will do it through my will. And he said, do it while your hands are still warm. Mm. And that was such a wise advice. Uh, I want to say a little bit about our relationship. My sister and I get along very well because we live far away from each other. Because <laughs> she's as stubborn as I am. And I always ask myself, why did my parents wait nine years to have me? And, uh, but the fact that I were different, we are different, she should take it as a compliment uh, and make sure of that. Now, I have a small heart. This is just too much for me. It's unbelievable how proud I am of my students, of this honor that you are rendering me. And I want to thank so many people. But I want first to give you a little bit of an idea of my relationship with this building. I came here to study at this school when it was the Juilliard School for my bachelor, for my master's degree, and then I stayed here, as Diane said, in the pre-college division. I was in the pre-college division teaching for seven years at Juilliard. Then I joined the Manhattan faculty, and I have been here for so many years. Now, I know that if you look at me, the first question you would ask, how could it be possible 
he's not that old. <laughs> but I have an answer for that. I started here with before I was born, actually. <laughs> um, uh, when I contemplated this idea, I never thought it was going to be so big. I thought about a studio on the second floor for me, for my teaching, a little bit larger. I could have more space for my memorabilia. Um, I invite you to visit my new studio here on the third floor right across. Uh, so uh, it was one man, Dean Emeritus Richard Adams, who encouraged me to go all the way and told me about this library. And I would have never thought that I would embark on such a big project. It's small, but it's big for me. I'm a teacher. So I thank him so much. He's here today, and he deserves an applause. I also wanted to mention that during those days at Juilliard, uh, the Cuban Revolution came about. And I was caught in the middle of having scholarships from the previous government and from the new government. And I had to uh, um, resist the pressure that I was under to move to Moscow Conservatory and continue my studies there. Uh, it was the Cold War. My parents were moving to Florida. And I was studying with Koronitsky, who was a pupil of Joseph Levine, so I felt I had the best Russian school right here in New York. <laughs> but in order, because the scholarship was canceled, there was no more dollars to be sent from Cuba to America, and also my family was leaving, I had to spend very difficult years in this building. Uh, it was not always uh, so sweet. I had to travel to Havana almost once a month, and because I had a diplomatic passport, I came back full of jewelry all over my body. My father was a jeweler. And I would come here at 8 o'clock in the morning. There were no credits at that time. You could take whatever you wanted. I took Gregorian chant. I took clarinet, violin, voice, organ, and, uh, and something else I forgot. But anyway, I um, had to spend my afternoons on 47th Street, you know, dealing with the Orthodox Jews and showing them this beautiful handmade jewelry that they were so crazy about. And then at night, I practiced for two hours. I was beginning to have trouble with my right hand. And then I would go to New Jersey to exchange Cuban money for American dollars. I'm saying all of this so I would go to jail tomorrow for all <laughs> kinds of reasons. So um, my father and I would speak in Yiddish so the Cuban government um, persons checking the conversation would not um, would not understand why we were doing something we should not be doing. Anyway, I'm not embarrassed. Uh, so my relationship with this building is very long, and it gives me a great pleasure to enhance one section of the building with this, which I think is a very beautiful small hall and my studio and all of that. Now, um, the other reason for the naming of, one reason for the naming of the hall, including the name Godless, which might surprise those of you who have known me for so many years only as Solomon Mikowski, is that my name in Cuba was Salomon Godless Mikowski. Godless was my father's family name. But when I studied with Goronitsky, contemplating a performance, performance career, he suggested that I use my mother's name, which was Mikowska, but being a male, I was Mikowski. And he said, use your Mikowski instead of the godless. So godless disappeared from my life for many decades. And I felt always so guilty. I'm so happy that my sister is here to see the sign that says Solomon, godless Mikowski. Now, um, I want to say something about this piano, which was dedicated to Shura Cherkasky. And he helped me teach many of these students because they listened to him. He was my favorite pianist for certain repertoire. And I wrote here, Shura Cherkasky, whose intoxicating sound still caresses my ears. Now, I think that some of you will back me up, Ren Zhang, who received the Shura Cherkasky Award, Yuan Shen, and some of you were my students when we used to come. And David Dubal, who is here in the audience, uh, was my classmate at Juilliard, and he and I shared the ecstasy of listening to David Dubal, uh, to uh, Shura <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
it's also a, an exorcist to listen to him talk. I invited him to do that. He said he wasn't going to be here. Suddenly he showed up. So the program will end 30 minutes earlier. <laughs> um, now, my interest is also with Cuba. I was born there. I'm Cuban. People can have different opinions about the government, about what's going on. I know life is very hard, and one can agree or disagree. But to me, what's important is that after the revolution, uh, Cuban musicians went to the Soviet Union and to Poland to study. So they created an incredible piano school, and there's so much talent in Cuba, you can't imagine. So when I have gone there, uh, I was invited in the year 2000 because I wrote a book about the 19th century composer, Inacio in Cervantes, the leading Cuban composer. And in this competition, uh, Yuan Shen was the first prize winner. So for me, it was an incredible experience to be sitting in the balcony where, as a child, I had heard Rubinstein, Horowitz, um, Heifetz, Renata Tebaldi, Mario del Monaco, the greatest stars of stars sang and performed in Havana. So I was sitting in the same seat and I was listening to my own pupil play a Chopin concerto, so beautiful. He had to play 13 anchors and even close the piano at the end to stop the love of music that was uh, expressed in such great applause. So that's why I decided that I want to have also a hall in Havana and a grand piano, consequent just like this, which is going right now, this month, to Havana with all the permission from the Treasury Department of the United States. It's all educational, and I will be proud when, as we contemplate in Cuba, to have a festival like I used to have in the Canary Islands with two orchestras, so I hope that some of my students will join me in Havana for a great festival with the symphony orchestra and solo recitals and the inauguration of this hall, which will give an opportunity for students graduating from the music school to have a great piano and a great place to perform. Now, um, another interest of mine has been to be able to teach students who come from my country, but I have never been able to achieve it. Uh, but now, uh, in the last few months, when I went last to Havana, I was able to listen to Will uh, uh, Darias. And Will Darias has just arrived in New York. She's here tonight. I want her to join me. She's the first Cuban student who has gotten permission from the State Department of the United States and the Cuban government to come to study in America since the revolution. <laughs> so confused, this is such a scribble, <laughs> you're right. Um, well, I want to begin my thanks. First of all, here in the back seat is Herbert Stessin. When I was a newcomer here, he felt that I had a little talent for teaching. And he supported me. Many of the, my early jobs were because of him. I listened to him teach, I listened to him play. I learned a lot from him. And the first time that I substituted for him was at the Henry Street Settlement. And that was on the Lower East Side. At that time, it was a Jewish neighborhood. I enjoyed teaching there because I could eat kreplach soup <laughs> every week, just like my mother used to make. But what happened the first time I showed up there is that there was a bank robbery. And as I was about to enter a street, a, a policeman was shooting literally at me. <laughs> it happened that the robber was next to me, and I didn't know. So I don't know if Herbert knew that I was going to happen and asked me to substitute for him for that reason. <laughs> but the fact is that it was a treasury to remember. Now, uh, I want to thank Suhatri Reisinger, who represents Clavier House. They have rebuilt this piano and restored it to sheer perfection. They have done so also with the second piano that will go into this hall, which is now currently in my studio.
and they have done, they are doing that also with the second piano in my studio, which will come in a, a month later. My students all have shared their approval of the quality, and I hope you have enjoyed the sound of this instrument. A big <laughs> Of course, I want to thank Diane Flagello, President Sirota, and James Candre for their very warm words. Most of it is exaggerated, don't believe a word, or just a few. But they were invited because they really represent a very important time in my life as I was developing. So those of you who are currently and were not asked to talk, uh, 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 the reason I had to do is that I want to remember the past. The present is here with me, and that's why I hope I didn't hear, hear, hurt any feelings. Um, uh, you, uh, I wanted to also say that it has been amazing that they have been able to play as well, because they all arrived the yesterday or the day before yesterday from long, some of them from China, from, from Spain, from Korea, and uh, the jet lag is a terrible thing when you're performing. There was one student who obviously didn't show jet lag today, that was Giovanni, mm -hmm. in his playing of Asturias. Uh, he played Asturias. Now, I want to thank Fiorella Canin and Cheryl Canelakis, because they were my associates for many years, and they helped me in my work, and they are two artists, teachers, and I want to express my appreciation for the help that they give me. <laughs> I want to recognize that an eminent Spanish pianist and professor at the Royal Conservatory in Madrid has joined me on a special trip from Spain, Fernando and his wife, Ana Puchol and I want to recognize their presence here, which honors me greatly. <laughs> I want to also point out that Simona's father, the great American art artist Simon Dinerstein, when I started teaching Simona, he gave me some small paintings of Simona and other things, some fruits, things that enhance the living room of my studio, my private studio. But recently, I acquired two special prints of Simona when she was a child. And one of them is hanging outside here. And what's interesting is that he depicts the dreams of Simona at that time. Who is she dreaming about? Glenn Gould, um, Wanda Landowska, um, Horowitz. And he also included me in three positions as a teacher, something that honors me greatly, and I hope you will admire this great artist that I'm so proud to be associated with through his so talented daughter, Simone and his wife, Simone Dinners. Uh, <laughs> there was a one important person in my life and work here who could not be here to today because he hurt his foot had an accident, Stanley Bednar, a great violin teacher and somebody who represents what Manhattan School of Music is all about. Um, I want to say that my students in playing here today are not only honoring me, but we discuss this and I can tell you, they are thanking this school because they all receive scholarships to come here. And that's what Manhattan is all about finding these talents and giving them everything they need to be able to continue and flourish. And I want to give them again an applause for coming here and saying thank you to Manhattan School of Music with their beautiful play. Now, I know, I will just mention the names, but I have to. Because in order to build this building and in order to produce this event, I didn't know how difficult it was and how many people had to be involved with so many responsibilities. Mr. President, you have no idea what a staff, well, I know you know, but you really don't. 
you know, and I know you're very demanding, but I drove them crazy. And uh, yes, I know. I'm, so, <laughs> I'm so appreciative. I don't know in what order I mentioned it, but I want to mention the following. Paul Kelleher, who is the Chief Financial Advisor at Manhattan. Susan Ebersole, who is here, who is Vice President for External Affairs. Susan Altshuler, her assistant. Angela Thurston, Adria McDonald, John Blanchard, alumni. John Perlman, donor relations. Linda Wells, who did the plaques for all the pianos. One is dedicated to Goronitsky, the second piano, my teacher, and the other one to my Cuban teacher, Centenat. Claude, uh, Claude Ka Klotz, who did an interview. Deborah Kinsler, who has worked so hard with public relations, David Geber, our dean. Jackie Mitchell, my God, she has been in charge of everything. And how she has been able to use her best psychology to say no to me, much better than the president, who is so <laughs> blunt. Um, Mary Catherine Blazek, who is chief of production. Alexis Caldwell, Kerry Lewis, Jamie Hogg. Christian Orto, who is now in charge, who is in charge of all the um, broadcasting overseas, the long distance learning. And this, this uh, program is being broadcast all over the world in internet and also to Cuba. If it happens that they are able to listen to it, it would be the best time ever that a cultural exchange has taken place through the internet between the United States and Cuba. Now, um, Jeff Harris, Director of Production, Stephen Vixo, Brian Mandelbaum, Kevin Botut, Dustin Chichero, <coughs> Misha Wolf, Bruce Bertrand, Julian Han, and Chris Shade. Susan M makes who do, did all the editing of the bios. My pupils are so egomaniacs, so she had to cut and cut and cut. <laughs> and, uh, and I told her to eliminate all the, uh, the non-important things, but to please leave something there for people to read. Um, let me see. Uh, now, very quickly, I know that it's late and this is taking too long, um, but I want to mention um, Martin Canning, who has been my colleague and from whom I have learned so much through years of exchanges, conversations. There you have a great teacher at the Julia School. Um, uh, one second. Harris Goldschmidt, the, one of the deans of reviewing uh, in New York, is here. And the best way to get a review is to mention it in the last speech. So that's exactly what I'm doing. But he deserves <laughs> all the praise. Um, uh, the, um, just one second. Well, Shirley Pearl. Shirley Pearl is the widow of George Pearl, the great American composer. George Pearl has been a major force in making my students learn 20th century music. And he has served me so well. To so these people who come without ever playing even Debussy to be able to get to know contemporary music, to somebody who wrote so beautifully for the, for the piano. And um, I'm almost finished. Uh, <laughs> And Vera Wilson from Astral, who recognized the talent of Simona and, um, and Alex Motuskin. And Eva Zinger, I want to mention, who brought me a great Russian teacher who lives in Brooklyn and who brought Alexander Motuskin into my life. And that has been one of the joys of my years of teaching. Well, I'm sure that I won't be able to sleep tonight in regret for not having said uh, given credit to so many people, but this is, I never expected I'll be so dizzy looking at these papers. <laughs> so I will stop right here. I thank you for coming. I thank you for sharing this great day with me. And I hope you will come back and listen to the music being made here, not by my student, but by the choir, the orchestra, the chamber music. This is what makes me happy, to open the door and see that music is being made here. That's great. Thank you.